Welcome back to day two of the Tudor Summit. I am super excited to introduce our first speaker today, Leanda Delisle. She was born in Westminster in London and read history at Somerville College, Oxford University, before taking up national newspaper and magazine columns and later publishing best-selling Tudor and Stuart history books. After Elizabeth, the death of Elizabeth and the coming of King James was runner-up for the Saltier Society's first Book of the Year award. Her next book, the New York Times bestselling biography, The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, The Tragedy of Mary Catherine and Lady Jane Grey, provided the nonfiction basis for Philippa Gregory's 2017 novel, The Last Tudor, and was described by Professor John Guy as gripping and an unrivaled account. Tudor, The Family Story, 1437 to 1603, is a biography of the dynasty and a Sunday Times top 10 bestseller. And her latest book, Winter King, is a biography of Charles I and his loss of three kingdoms. Based on her new manuscript discoveries with many never-before-seen royal letters, it describes a brave king who, like the tragic heroes of Greek myth, falls not because of wickedness, but because of human flaws and misjudgment. And it reveals the true role of his remarkable and maligned queen. She regularly writes and speaks on matters for historical TV, radio, and a number of publications, including The Times, Daily Mail, Mail on Sunday, Daily Express, BBC History Magazine, History Today, The Literary Review, and The New Criterion and The Spectator. So welcome to Leanda Delisle, who is going to share with us lots of new information about Charles I. And I think that's one of the first things I want to ask you about. There's this idea that Charles is a bit of a failure, um, you know, that he, we just kind of remember him for his ending. And your book dives into a lot more the human part of Charles I. Can you share with me a little bit about why you chose him and as a subject and kind of how you feel about him, I suppose? Well, you know, obviously I love the Tudor period. I've written three books about so the Tudor period. But there's a lot of the drama and the stories of the Tudor period only really find resolution uh, during uh, the reign of Charles I. So uh, doing the Tudors without doing Charles is a bit like not reading the end of the story in a way. Um, and it's an incredibly exciting and moving story and one that's got um, fascinating women in it who have been overlooked. Um, and well, Charles himself, as you say, he's had this reputation. Uh, he's the failed king who you know, was executed at the hands of his own subjects. Um, but there was a story before then. You know, all our lives take different paths. If we had turned left instead of right, if we'd done this instead of that, how different our lives might have been. Charles wasn't destined to failure. Um, it happened, it happened in the end. And it was a tragic story for him and for his kingdoms. And it, you talked a little bit about the continuation of the Tudor story, and it does seem like the, the themes around the questions of where the power is with Parliament or the King uh, it reaches, obviously, its, its culmination with, with Charles. Can you talk a little bit about that struggle and how it started during the Tudor period and then kind of what Charles inherited then? Gosh, well, there's sort of two aspects to this, one of which is religious, the Reformation, and the other which is uh, political, the relationship with Parliament. And, and of course, um, uh, they are linked. Um, and so um, each of the Tudors changed the um, religion of, of, of their country, each of the later Tudors, that is, you know, from Henry VIII. Henry VIII created a kind of particular Henrician Catholicism. Then you had Edward VI, who introduced a kind of Calvinist Protestantism. Then you had Mary Tudor, Catholicism, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, each of them um, brought in their own. When Charles came along, he also wanted uh, to uh, define the Church of England in a particular way. Uh, and a way, and a way actually that would have suited Elizabeth I very well. Mm -hmm. um, but although we think of Elizabeth as a very strong queen, uh, she was, as we all said, in a very weak position because she was a woman uh, and she was childless. Um, and so she wasn't able to impose her particular vision for the Church of England on the kingdom in the way that Charles felt he could. Mm -hmm. And he, he liked a kind of what we would think of as a kind of high church form of Protestantism rather than a more stripped down form. Um, and that angered um, many of those who preferred 
the more stripped down version. And then you've got, okay, politics. So that's religion. And then you've got politics. Um, politics, parliament uh, was, um, incre again, when Elizabeth became queen, because she was a woman, uh, there was a very strong feeling, particularly actually amongst Protestants, that a woman couldn't rule, that a woman had no right to rule over men, that there were biblical injunctions against it. And so they argued that, in fact, um, it wasn't really Elizabeth who was ruling, it was her in Parliament, her with Parliament. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty lay with the monarch in Parliament. Um, the Stuarts argued against that and said, no, sovereignty, sovereignty lay with the monarch. And one of the reasons they did that is that um, uh, taking sovereignty away from the monarch had encouraged um, people to believe that it was they could be justified to assassinate uh, any monarch or any ruler they didn't approve of, whose religion they didn't approve of in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had um, Protestants assassinating or trying to assassinate Catholic monarchs, and you had Catholics trying to assassinate Protestant monarchs. Um, and um, the Stuarts argued that actually kings had a divine right to rule given by God and that no one had the right to just go around murdering them, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he had a hard time getting money from Parliament and funding everything, right? Yes, um, he did because um, uh, from the beginning he had, uh, he had some difficult opponents uh, and they are also very much linked to the Tudor period. So um, those of you who love the Tudor period uh, will remember the Earl of Essex, who was Elizabeth's last uh, great favorite, um, but who died a traitor executed on the scaffold. He revolted against her. Um, anyway, his uh, nephews and nieces uh, play as a leading role in my book, uh, White King. Uh, two brothers in particular, uh, Robert Rich, Earl of Warwick, uh, who was one of the first, you know, who, was a, who was a great sort of privateer against the Spanish, and also very interested in the early colonies of the, what later become, became the United States. Uh, places like Warwick, Rhode Island are named after him. Um, he was involved in the Pierce patent uh, with the Mayflower. Um, you know, he was involved with Virginia, Massachusetts, and all these things. Um, and um, he, uh, was um, uh, essentially a Puritan or a supporter of Puritans, a more sort of low church form of Protestantism that Charles was trying to change. Mm -hmm. and so he was a very strong opponent of Charles. And if Charles didn't do as he wanted or he felt Charles was, had policies that, that Warwick didn't approve of, then Warwick would encourage his supporters in Parliament not to give Charles the taxes he needed mm -hmm. uh, to, for example, pay for his armies who were fighting in Europe at one point. He had a younger brother, the Earl of Holland, Henry, um, Earl of Holland, um, who um, was actually the king's closest body servant, uh, but then betrayed him at the outbreak of civil war. Mm. And then they had a cousin. They were both all, as I said, they were all nieces and nephews of uh, Essex, the famous Earl of Essex, um, uh, called Lucy Hay, Countess of Carlisle, who's a great character as well, and who's a great friend of the Queen's, but also then turns enemy. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so actually, I realized I kind of got a little bit of my, ahead of myself, and I was wondering if you could give me kind of a brief overview of Charles's life uh, and kind of how he was raised to be king and, and how it, I guess, just kind of his, a little bit about his wife and who he, just his, his life leading up to the, the mess that he got into. And then we can talk a little bit about how things turned so badly for him. Right, yes, okay, so um, he was um, born in Scotland uh, when his father was still just King of Scots. Um, he was just a baby when Elizabeth I died and his father inherited the throne of England and became the first King of Scotland and of England. Uh, he was a very uh, weak, sickly baby and he's about left in Scotland for a year and didn't come down to England until 1604, a year after Elizabeth had died. Um, he had uh, a sort of lingual deformity, so he probably couldn't eat or drink milk properly, um, and he had weak legs. Mm. Um, 
And people often look back on this and they sort of use it as a kind of symbol of sort of weakness of character. And it's funny how we, we still have these strange patterns of thinking where disability or deformity are seen as weaknesses of character. So if anybody saw um, the last Wonder Woman film, for example, you'd have noticed that Wonder Woman, the heroine, is a beautiful, perfect physical specimen and her enemy, uh, Dr. Poison, also a woman, is disfigured. I mean, it's extraordinary we still think like that, but um, we do. But anyway, so this is sort of used as a stick to beat Charles with. But in fact, um, Charles was very determined to get over his disabilities. And I think what is more interesting than the fact that he had them when he was a, a boy um, is that he worked very hard to overcome them. And by the time he was a teenager, uh, he was extremely strong runner and was becoming a very good horseman mm. and was extremely fit. Um, he taught himself to speak eloquently by, with singing lessons and pausing before he spoke. So um, he didn't, he wasn't garrulous. Um, he was quite concise and witty. He was a funny man um, when he spoke, um, but he didn't go in for long speeches because, you know, he, he, because he had, a, had had a childhood stutter. Mm. He had an elder brother uh, who um, uh, died. Um, in fact, Charles was at his deathbed very pathetically, um, um, watched his brother die um, when, he, when Charles was 12, I think, just 12. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, they were treat treating, essentially, the doctors were treating this boy's tuberculosis by tying a dead pigeon to his head, mm. which obviously wasn't very effective, so he died. Um, at which point, um, so he's still quite young, and we have to remember that Henry VIII was also a younger son. Mm. So people make a lot of Charles being a younger son. Henry VIII was a younger son. It wasn't a big deal. Elder brothers died. That's right. what happened in those days. Mm. Um, and um, uh, James then raised Charles to rule as a ruler. Um, and uh, he um, inherited the throne when he was almost 25. Um, he was very energetic. Um, he wanted to take Britain into the Thirty Years' War in Europe to fight in the Protestant cause and in the cause of his sister, who was caught up in the wars in Europe, um, uh, the so-called Winter Queen of Bohemia. Mm. Um, to this end, he married a French princess uh, because he wanted to use French armies to help Britain. Um, Henrietta Maria, who was only 15 at the time, a young girl. Uh, and their marriage is a bit like, I don't know if you remember the old, probably don't, the old Mills and Boone novels that I remember as a teenager. They were kind of, sort of romance novels. Uh, and in these kind of, you know, cheap romance novels, it, the, you know, the love affairs always start with a couple hating each other. They're always, you know, there's always quarrels. They never like each other, you know. And then, you know, then one day they fall in love for whatever reason, you know. They overcome their sort of... And that's all that's always this, how these romantic novels always used to work, these Mills and Boone romance mm -hmm. novels. And um, Charles and Henrietta Maria's marriage was very like this uh, Mills and Boone novel in that it starts with them, um, you know, with them quarreling, just not really liking each other or getting on. But then you have to remember they were very young. I mean, this is a teenage girl, Henrietta Maria, 15 mm -hmm. years old, taken away from France, surrounded by people who don't much like her because she's French um, and a Catholic. And a Catholic. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is important, of course. And, um, but, you know, Charles and Henrietta Maria do fall very much in love and have uh, many children together. And it proves to be a very strong marriage. Um, Charles um, has strengths as a king, but also weaknesses. Um, and um, his weaknesses are that he, he lacks ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. He's not a, he dislikes violence at one point. Charles says that, you know, only, only he's in cruelty. He says only cowards are cruel. But, you know, he is in a cruel and violent age. Mm -hmm. So he lacks ruthlessness in dealing with his enemies, whereas they are quite ruthless, more ruthless than he is. And um, also he's a bad, he's a poor politician. He's, mm -hmm. he, he's almost slightly, or, almost slightly autistic. I mean, he doesn't read people terribly well. He doesn't have an instinct for people so um it takes him a while to learn to trust people when he does his trust is complete mm -hmm. um and he tends to lump all his enemies together rather than saying oh well you know they don't have things in common i can play them off against each other or i can persuade them round he doesn't he doesn't have that political sense really mm -hmm. um which is definitely a weakness and um 
the, it ends with you know him having terrible quarrels with his parliament. His leading minister, the Earl of um, Duke of Buckingham, is murdered, um, and then you know he rules without parliament uh, for eleven years. Mm -hmm. um, and this ends when he um, and it's all going reasonably well for him at that stage. But it ends when he tries to impose his version of Protestantism, his sort of his um, more um, like a more ritualistic mm -hmm. form of Protestantism on Calvinist Presbyterian Scotland. You know, you don't push around the Scots, you know, it's a small country, but you know, it's a small kingdom, but you know, they're tough as nails, the Scots, as we all know, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> they didn't take kindly to this and uh, rebelled. And uh, that was really the beginning of Charles's downfall. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me a little bit about his about his wife because she was quite the strong character as well and and when after he was in prison she went and tried to fight for him and everything can you tell me a little bit about her yes I, in fact uh, she's going to be the subject of my next uh, book because uh, and uh, she plays quite a strong role in this one um she, because she is a very remarkable character her father um was the great warrior king of France, Henri IV, her who was murdered, assassinated um, by a religious fanatic uh, when she was just a baby. Mm. Uh, and uh, so her first experience actually of rule a ruler was her mother, was a woman, her mother, uh, who uh, ruled as regent for her brother. Um, as I said, she arrived in England when she was only 15, still very young and very so much a sort of typical teenager, you know, strong tempered, you know, um, um, get very distressed, you know, when her husband decides to sort of send all her friends back to France and she was left all alone in England, you know, and she would sort of cry and weep and sort of be very annoyed. Strong character, a colorful character. But then you know, as she, as she matures, um, she's a highly intelligent one as well. Uh, she's had a bad press, because, um, because basically her history has been written largely by her enemies sure. and by contemporary propaganda. Uh, one of which is that um, you know, she led Charles astray. Yeah. I think it's very, you know, this is a story that goes back to Adam and Eve, that yeah. we, the women, you know, we are terrible seducers, poor, poor men, you know, poor, poor men, you know. Um, you know, we wander around looking a bit pretty and then, you know, they do terrible things at our, at our behest. Yeah. Um, but, you know, behind the pretty mask is, you know, the sort of devil, you know, like, like the witch in Snow White or whatever. Like this, a sea wolf, like Margaret of Anjou or any, any of them. Absolutely, exactly. Margaret of Anjou treated very much the same way. I'm also a huge fan of Margaret of Anjou. Love Margaret of Anjou, but anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yes, absolutely. Um, and um, whereas in fact, she was uh, extremely support, just extremely supportive of her husband. Uh, she wasn't involved so much in English politics, up to a point she was involved in English politics. Mainly she saw herself as a protector of the Catholic minority, which was persecuted. She was, after all, a Catholic herself. But as the Civil War drew closer, then she stepped up to the plate, really, because um, Charles needed her support at this stage. Um, and, um, you know, she had to help him. So she, she left for Europe to raise money for him, to raise an army for him. Uh, she brought back an army from Europe. She actually, you know, was with this army under shell fire, um, there's an amazing description of her with, with men being blown to pieces, yards from her, um, you know, and, uh, you know, she was with this army when it won battles. Uh, she was an extraordinary woman. And then when she had to leave England, she even had a baby while she was out there seeing Charles, you know, unbelievable, really. Um, she had to abandon this baby to go back to France, where she continued to you know, work uh, for her husband's uh, cause. Um, right up into the restoration of her son. So she was an amazing woman. Yeah. Well worth yeah. reading about. Yeah, well, we'll wait for you to book on her then to <laughs> give us a little taster there. Um, they were very much um, devoted to their family and, and their children. And, uh, you know, it seems like so much of your book talks about the way the, the children were handled, because they were separated then, and some of them were kept uh, prisoners, I suppose. And can you talk a little bit about kind of how how they functioned as a family and and there's that moving scene before Charles is executed when he's saying goodbye to his children and uh, can you talk just a little bit about him as a father? 
he was obviously an absolutely devoted father. Um, it's very touching. So before the Civil War, um, you know, he and there are descriptions of 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 Charles and Henrietta Maria taking their children to the park and playing with them. Mm -hmm. You know, he would measure them. He would measure their growth on a sort of staff. Um, he kept pictures of them, paintings of them by Van Dyck. You know, all around him in his personal quarters. Mm -hmm. um, he was obviously devoted to his children. And then, as you say, during the Civil War, um, they were. Uh, he was with his two elder sons at the beginning. They were still tiny. Uh, James was nine. Um, I think Charles was 12, 11 or 12. Charles, the future Charles II, this was. Mm -hmm. um, and they were accompanied him in battle. I mean, they were at Edge Hill with him, the opening battle of the Civil War. Um, again, you know, with shot going over their heads. Um, and uh, so the, the two younger boys were spent quite a lot of the Civil War actually with the king. Um, the others often, particularly the, young, the youngest ones, imprisoned um, by, um, by Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, then when Charles himself became a prisoner, he was able to see his younger children, his youngest children again. Uh, Parliament let him see them. Um, and um, there are incredibly moving descriptions of him playing, playing with them, with them sitting on his lap. Um, you know, he adored his little daughter, um, Elizabeth, um, who, who later died when she was still young in Parliament's care. Mm. Um, and then as you say, then um, there's the horrendous description of his last meeting with the younger ones, which I don't, I mean, I don't think I can even speak out loud now because I'll start blobbing, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, so, yeah. it's so awful um, and so moving, um, him talking to these children the day before he's executed um, and he's got these sort of pathetic sort of last gifts for them mm -hmm. um, and, he's, and he tells his youngest son, um, Henry, um, you know, that they're going to chop off his head his you know, yeah. own head, and that um, and that he mustn't. They will try and make him a king, and that he mustn't be king. He must be loyal to his elder brothers, who whose right, who who have escaped by this stage, and are in Europe, and and whose right precedes, you know, Henry's right. Mm -hmm. um, the little boy's about five years old, and he sort of says uh, that he'll die first rather than, you know, <laughs> do as Parliament says. Um, anyway, it's an, it is. A, yeah, very very moving. Yeah. And that kind of then takes me to his, his trial or the, that he was found guilty. What he, he didn't put up any kind of defense, did he? He just said that he didn't recognize the, the court or, you know, and how, how on earth did parliament, how did they justify trying a, a king? Well, um, it's interesting. They had tried one monarch before in very different circumstances, and that was Mary, Queen of Scots. Yeah. Now, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, was beheaded for treason against Elizabeth I. Now, the fact was that she was Queen of Scots. She wasn't an English subject, um, and therefore they had no right to chop off her head for treason because she couldn't commit treason against another queen. Yeah. Um, but so they had twisted you know, history and fact and the law, really, to argue that, oh, Scotland was a subservient nation. Mm. I don't think the Scots would have agreed with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so that in some way that she owed fealty to Elizabeth and therefore they could chop off her head, which they did. Mm -hmm. um, with Charles, it was a bigger problem. Um, he was you know, England's ruling monarch. Um, treason was an act against the king, not by the king in English law. Right. Um, but so again, they changed, they changed, um, they just sort of changed the law really. They just said uh, that actually no, Oh, treason was something you could commit against the people and against Parliament, um, and um, that sovereignty lay with the people. Um, and so they just basically changed the law. Um, and also they'd abolished the House of Lords, which was you know, the highest court in the land. And the Commons had made themselves essentially a court. Yeah. Um, and then they had to make it retroactive so that it was... Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 they did, absolutely. Hmm. Um, I think, but what they hoped was, they, they hoped... Because um, actually, the new model army was really in charge because they'd purged Parliament. Of course, they'd got rid of all the MPs they didn't like. They, mm. The members of Parliament they didn't like. They'd actually come in with armed men and had just got rid of you know, don't like you, don't like your views, don't like your views. You can stay. You can stay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it wasn't really um, a proper Parliament in any normal sense. It, it was really sort of managed by a sort of military dictatorship, essentially. Mm. Um, 
Uh, but they still hoped that what would happen would, would be that Charles would recognise the court, um, that he would probably be found guilty of uh, treason uh, uh, against uh, the people, whatever. Um, and But then Parliament would be able to pardon him. Mm -hmm. uh, but he would have, by having recognised the court, he would recognise the superiority, the sovereignty of, of Parliament and of the Commons um, in particular. Um, and then they could put him on the throne, essentially as a puppet king, as a constitutional monarch, you might say. Right. Um, that's what they hoped. But Charles um, would not recognise the court. And because he wouldn't recognise the court, they were left with no option, really, but to chop off his head. Um, that's why Charles argued that he, had died, he was dying as a martyr for the law and for the people, as well as for his religious beliefs, um, because he said that, Parliament, the court were breaking the law um, and that he was standing for the law. Um, that's why he claimed to be a martyr for the people. Um, it seems like it was kind of a, a game of chicken that got out of hand for them. I think that's exactly right. It was. It was definitely. I think, and I think Charles misjudged, as he often did misjudge things, he misjudged their ruthlessness. And, um, and um, yes, um, and, um, and their game of chicken didn't work. Yeah. No, it didn't. And um, I also want to ask you, there were some other very strong women involved in this period, like you talked about Lucy Carlyle, and can you share a little bit about uh, who she was and some of these other people who were kind of on the, on the periphery around him when he was in prison and playing, playing their roles? Oh, yes. Well, okay. Well, Lucy Carlyle's a great uh, character. Um... She is, again, a niece of the, you know, Elizabeth the first last favourite, the Earl of Essex, mm -hmm. first cousin to these uh, rich brothers, whose mother was somebody called Penelope Deverux, who was also a very strong Elizabethan character. But anyway, <laughs> she is uh, also a descendant of Mary Boleyn. I mean, she's a direct descendant of Mary Boleyn. And, and she is sort of, at one point I call her the last Boleyn girl. She is quite amazing. She's very, very sexy woman. Um, very attracted to power, uh, and to be attracted to power means you have to be near powerful men, of course, in those days. Um, so um, when Henrietta Maria first comes in England, uh, she's told that, you know, that Lucy Carlyle's hoping to be Charles's mistress. Um, but anyway, Charles isn't interested in having a mistress, so that doesn't work out, but she is the mistress of his most powerful minister, the Duke of Buckingham. Um, but she becomes very close to the Queen. Um, at first, they start off as sort of not liking each other, but they become very close. She's because she's good company, Lucy Carlyle. She's very, she's very, she gives great funny dinner parties. Um, you know, she's not Henrietta Maria doesn't like people who are a bit snobby and dull and snooty. She likes she likes to you know relax and have fun and you know gossip and do things like that. And Lucy Carlyle's great at that, uh, and. Both of them are interested in, you know, are political players, and um, and uh, Lucy is very much that. She's a Protestant, um, who although she lives a rather sort of naughty lifestyle, and you know, Duke of Buckingham is a married man she's having an affair with. You know, she's no she saint, mm -hmm. as she later becomes called. Um, but uh, but she is also uh, um, a Protestant who has sympathies with the Puritan cause. Um, and is anti-Spanish. And in fact, she has, that's what she has in common with Henrietta Maria at the beginning, is they're both anti-Spanish, Henrietta Maria, because she's French. Mm -hmm. um, later on, um, she's also, uh, Buckingham is murdered. She becomes close to um, Charles's most, another of Charles's most powerful ministers, a man called um, Thomas Wentworth, Earl of uh, Stratford. Um, and she's very close to him. Uh, that he is then executed, um, um, uh, rather unfortunately, um, actually uh, uh, by Parliament, essentially. Um, and um, she then becomes close to the King's enemy, um, Pym, John Pym, who's a Puritan MP in Parliament. And she begins, to, having been the Queen's closest friend, she starts shifting um, and it actually becomes very close to Parliament. And just before the Civil War, she basically becomes a spy for... Charles and Henrietta Maria's enemies. And they only realize this um, on the point uh, when they have to flee London just before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, during the Civil War, when Henrietta Maria is writing letters in code, she um, 
uses as her own code name the name Lucy Carlyle, oh. really as a sort of mark of you know contempt for mm. her former friend. Mm. But then during the Civil War, the the the, the revolution moves leftward, and eventually um, Lucy Carlyle feels she doesn't want to be part of this revolution anymore and she becomes a royalist again mm -hmm. and um during what's called the second civil war she is a spy for the king and so when the king is executed she is in fact in the tower of london like her great 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 aunt you know anne boleyn before her mm -hmm. um but unlike anne she, she isn't beheaded mm -hmm. uh i won't say what her fate is but it is it is it is um it is really quite a sort of classic moment, her, her ultimate fate. So I'll leave that for readers to discover. <laughs> yes, so by the book. Um, and then I, I have another question about kind of bringing, I have, I have two more main, actually maybe there's three here. Um, the, the idea, they kind of go together of his name, why he was called the White King, and also the idea of kind of propaganda, the propaganda around them. I, I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about just this, these myths around him and the propaganda against him um, was the one one kind of area that I wanted to touch on. And then the other one, you talked about these players who were also involved in the Americas. And this is interesting because we actually see some role that the that the New World had in in the politics of England at this point, with the, some of the colonies being involved in um, supporting the the different players. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that too. So those are the two the two main other areas I wanted to ask you about. Okay, yes. Okay, so the White King. Um, so, um, Charles um, was uh, um, crowned. He was wearing a white satin suit with a sort of purple mantle. Um, but a sort of myth grew up that he'd been entirely dressed in white and that he was the first King of England ever to have been crowned in white. This wasn't mm. exactly true. Was, he was wearing the same clothes his father had worn. <laughs> but, um, why do they, the question is why would they and why would this become invented um and again i think it was a part of a sort of propaganda thing so mm -hmm. during the civil war charles's enemies said you know that he was the white king of of of, of prophecy um that there were prophecies uh, of, of a white king who would um be um a tyrant uh, who would be destroyed by his own people mm -hmm. and that's what they said he was the white king of the prophecies of merlin um, but then his supporters said, no, uh, that's not true. Um, he is, um, he's, he's, a, he's the white king uh, because these white robes represent his innocence, his purity, his goodness, uh, mm -hmm. and the fact that he was prepared to die as a martyr for his people. Um, and then when he um, is, um, after he's executed, his, um, he's buried at uh, Windsor Castle uh, in the chapel. Um, and um, there's supposed to be a snowstorm uh, as he's carried um, out of the hall of Windsor Castle to, the, to St George's Chapel. Um, and the white snow covers the black velvet pool, uh, mm. turning it white. And a witness who's there says, you know, and so, you know, the white king went to his grave. Mm. Eventually, you know, in, 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 in this snowy, yeah. Um, in fact, I suspect that uh, story was uh, invented by this man who uh, was a parliamentarian uh, who was very who wrote it during the reign of Charles II. Uh, was keen to suck up to Charles II, um, you know, and was a professional liar. So whether there was actually snow, we don't know. <laughs> but that's all a part again of, as you say, the propaganda and the myths that surround Charles. Um, there's the myth that he was controlled by his wife. Um, there's the myth that he was a sort of physically puny specimen. He's always made to appear, appear, appear sort of rather effeminate. Um, but actually, you know, he produced a brood of uh, children that Henry VIII, uh, who actually suffered from impotence, uh, could only have uh, envied. Um, you know, as I said, he was a physically strong, healthy man um, who... Um, you know, loved women and had um, mistresses before he married. He didn't, and he actually did have a mistress after he married as well. He'd been separate, when he'd been separated forcibly from Henrietta Maria for a number of years, he had a liaison we know about uh, with a red-haired 
um, royalist spy um, who he um, tried to um, meet um, actually in his, you know, closet in his, um, you know, basically his bathroom lavatory um, when he was shut up in Carisbrook Castle. And he writes very, you know, blunt letters about how he wants to, you know, have sex with her um, you know, in, in, in quite, you know, direct language, let's put it like that. Mm. <laughs> um so yes yeah, so so again that's another sort of myth about charles i think that he's sort of you know sort of weakling effeminate um um that you know that also that he didn't have support um that he was unpopular well, yes he was unpopular with some but he was hugely popular with others mm -hmm. and also i think you know he learned from his mistakes so he became he became a rather good leader in battle for example during the civil war um and he was loved in a way, when he died, he was loved in a way that his son, the merry monarch Charles II, never would be. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's worth remembering about Charles. Um, so what was your next question? Uh, this is the role, it's the role of the, um, the new world in that this is the first time you start to see, well, not, that, that there's this kind of link now and, and the colonies take an interest in, in what's yes. going on, obviously. Yes. No, I find it absolutely fascinating, um, very much so. A lot of the opposition to Charles um, early in his reign are linked to the American colonies, of course, with, 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 with the Puritans. The Puritans. Right. Right. Uh, so not surprisingly so. Um, yeah. As I said, you have people like you know, Robert Rich, Earl of Warwick, who is you know, um, a leading opponent to the king in Parliament, um, who is a great investor, in um in the american colonies uh, and endure indeed when when during the uh, 11 years when charles was ruling without parliament many of of charles's opponents including oliver cromwell uh, were thinking of emigrating to um uh, to the to the colonies um but then the wars with Scotland began and, and, and literally just at the moment they were all about to get on the boat practically um, and um, that changed and instead what happened which I find quite fascinating is a number of people who had previously gone to the colonies and had made lives for them there came back. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you had for example um, one of the uh, governors of Harvard College um, came back um, and became a leading figure. He became the sort of leading chaplain of the new model army. Mm. Um, and I uh, was there at Charles's trial um, and, you know, gave sermons, um, you know, just before Charles's execution. I uh, was a very important figure. Um, and, there were, and there were many, and there were many others, many others who were leading captains fighting in the war, um and um so forth i mean and they were obviously royalists too which i know i unfortunately i know less about I, i'd like to do more research on those because of course maryland is named after henrietta mariah okay. who was known as queen mary so um i i'd be interested in studying more about maryland actually in the future mm -hmm. yeah yeah if anyone wants to send me stuff about maryland <laughs> that'd be good. Perfect. Perfect. Great. well um you have answered all of my questions and i want to now also give you an opportunity to talk about where people can get your books and learn more about your work and i'm sure everybody who's watching this has at least seen your books but if you can just share a little bit about the books that you've written and what you're working on now and um, where people can catch more of you um well i have a website a rather sort of simple website um leanderdelisle.com um, and you can mm -hmm. see um, all my books there mm -hmm. and indeed um, there's a podcast as well um, 10 minute tutors if you're interested in that mm -hmm. um, what else do I have on that website oh and I've got um, a link to a couple of um, lectures I think as well on YouTube there's one on Lady Jane Grey you might uh, you might all like mm -hmm. um, which um, I did when I was involved with the BBC series about her um, so yes, the books are all there. there as I said, there's one, uh, there's one on, on, the, on, on Elizabeth's rivals, uh, Lady Jane Grey and her sisters. Many people don't know about Lady Jane Grey's sisters and uh, that seems to be a popular book with readers. Um, was that, that was the inspiration for Philippa Gregory's novel, right? That's right, yes it was. Yes, absolutely, yes it was. Um, which was very kind of her to point that out. Yes, absolutely it was. Um, and um, I've written a book on the whole dynasty Mm -hmm. um, beginning um, 
right back um, lot, uh, the before the Battle of Bosworth, right in the middle of the 15th century, so long before just Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, mm -hmm. called uh, Tudor, the family story, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, focuses on all the, all the family members, really. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope um, your readers might enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, there's one on the death of Elizabeth and the accession of King James. And then there's this latest one, The White King, The Tragedy of Charles I, which is about uh, Charles. Um, and you can read some bits about them on, on, on my website um, and you can buy them. I think it has links with this. There's Amazon, of course, yeah. obviously. Um, but there are also lots of independent bookshops, Waterstones um, and um, many others. Um, um, and if they haven't got one in stock, I'm sure they can order it. All these books are in print. Yeah, um, nice. So, um, yes, I think okay. that's. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's perfect. Perfect. And I'll put links all around on the, the web page where this is showing as well. So people can look those. There's probably going to be links down here somewhere below the video. So everybody can look there. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time and for sharing so much with us about Charles the First. I, um, I learned a lot from your book. And like you said, after I got done reading it, I thought, well, why did I not? It's almost like you said, the bookends of the Tudor dynasty with the the Wars of the Roses over here on this side, and you can't really understand the early tutors unless you understand the Wars of the Roses, and then the later tutors, the end, the culmination of it all here in, in the English. That, that's exactly right. It begins with the Civil War and it ends with the Civil War, yeah. interestingly. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I, I really enjoyed learning more about that. So thank you for that. Um, cool. Um, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs>